Welcome students to our lesson summary review tonight. We're continuing with our course Foundations for Discipleship. We're on lesson four this week, which is entitled Discovering and Doing. As we take a look at our lesson outline, we're going to talk about two concepts of learning, changing the learner, levels of learning, how people learn, and learning to nurture Christian growth. Our objectives for this lesson is outlined in your study guide. Hopefully when you're finished with this lesson, you'll be able to recognize that learning must be a personal interaction with an application of the lesson to life situations. Hopefully you'll also be able to describe how people learn by identifying various levels of learning ranging from simple to complex involvement and thirdly, prayerfully you'll be able to discuss how those involved in Christian nurture may facilitate the learning and internalizing of spiritual truth so that learners may become more Christ-like in their thinking, attitudes, and actions. As always, we have several key words listed in your study guide. And you can look those up in the glossary at the end of your study materials. That will help you to grasp the correct understanding of these words as you encounter them throughout our lesson. So let's go ahead and begin with our first lesson outline, which is two concepts of learning. Our first objective want us to evaluate and correctly classify activities to determine whether they result in transfer or discovery learning. Now you already have some understanding of what learning and teaching are, no doubt. Your definitions may not be technical nor formalized, but you have some idea what these words mean. So you were asked in one of our lesson outlines here, to write a simple definition of these terms as you personally understand them. So I want you students to take time in your note taking material to write a simple definition for the word learning. And also write a simple definition for the word teaching. So as you do so, as you write your personal understanding of these two words, you are asked to write a definition as you understand them. And since you wrote what you think, there can be no right or wrong answer. Now, many people hold one or the other of two popular points of view on this matter. And as I explain them, I want you to decide which view is more like the one you wrote. Some people regard telling as teaching and listening as learning. If someone tells a story, states facts, or explains information, it is assumed he has taught. If someone listens when a teacher does these things, it is assumed that he has learned. The learner may be expected to write or copy the teacher's words and or memorize them. If the learner can recall the information later and recite the teacher's exact words according to this view, he has demonstrated mastery of the material, or in other words, he has learned. Now, teachers who perceive the teaching learning process is in this way talk a lot and require their learners to sit and listen quietly. They believe that teachers teach lessons. Therefore, they view the lesson content as the key element in the process. To them, teaching is seen as the transfer of information from the teacher to the learner. Now, how do you suppose this interaction affects the teacher's style of teaching in the classroom. Well, the teacher in this context 
is considered a source of knowledge. He is supposed to have extensive knowledge of the subject. And the learner is viewed as having little or no knowledge of the subject. The teacher's task, therefore, is to transfer this superior knowledge of the subject to the empty mind of the learner. This concept of teaching learning process has led many teachers to attempt to lecture rapidly in order to cover as many facts to complete their lessons and give the learner maximum exposure to much material. Now, because this view expects a transfer of knowledge from the teacher to the learner, it is called either the transfer approach or transfer learning. Another method of teaching operates on the assumption that the learner is the subject of the operation and must be involved in the process. Adherents to this point of view believe that the learner should be equipped to do more than merely recite the information correctly. They want the learner to understand the material and be able to relate it to its previous knowledge, developing some personal convictions about it and learning to use it in establishing values as a basis for solving life's problems. This approach requires the learner to interact personally with the material. The learner must discover truth through his own efforts. Now, as we looked at these two points of views, you notice the different emphasis in the second approach. The teacher teaches a person rather than a lesson. The learner and the results of his learning are the important elements. This teaching method requires the teacher to guide the learner in the process of learning. Its adherence do not equate filling the learner's mind with knowledge with significant learning. They do believe that the teacher can and should help the learner discover and apply truth. And because of this, this view is called either the discovery approach or discovery learning. So we've looked at two examples, two different approaches to learning and teaching. You see in your student guide, there's an illustration that depicts the transfer method, which was the first example we talked about, and the discovery approach. In the transfer method, the teacher seeks to fill the learner with information. In the discovery approach, the teacher seeks to lead the learner to discover the truth for himself. So as we think about these two methods, I want you to think about the approach that has been most effective in your life. It may be a combination of both. So you may have studied classes where both of these concepts of teaching and learning were followed. In the past, students, the transfer approach was common and it is still used. However, modern teachers tend to follow the discovery approach. The discovery approach is based on current understanding which has resulted under the transfer approach. You may have wondered if it was the best approach. It is indeed important to understand many facts that concern us in today's world. It is important to be able to remember and recall this information, which helps us to be more practical and more knowledgeable and to alert us to life around us. However, it is far more practical to understand the facts you have learned in a way which can be applied to the actual solving of real life problems. This ability to apply knowledge 
as we shall see, comes through experience, through use. So I want you to memorize the following definitions of teaching and learning. You will be required to recognize the correct definitions of these words in your self-test and also in your student examination. The first definition I'm going to give you is a definition for learning. Learning is discovering information and making desired responses to that information. Again, learning is discovering information and making desired responses to that information. The second definition is for teaching. Teaching is helping people learn. Teaching is helping people learn. In other words, you're helping people to discover information and to make desired responses to that information. Now, perhaps you are beginning to understand that teaching and learning are interdependent. Generally speaking, if one teaches effectively, according to the foregoing definition, learning results. If receptive leaders or learners fail to learn anything, effective teaching has not taken place. We may think of teaching and learning as two sides of one coin. They are inseparably joined as two parts of one whole concept. And because of the students, we will refer to the process as teaching learning. Now let's look at our second outline, which is changing the learner. Thus far, we have talked about the two concepts of learning. Now our second objective asks us to identify learning results associated with change through a learning type. Now change is essential to learning. The learner discovers information and responds to it. If the learner does not change, learning has not taken place. If learning has not taken place, teaching has been ineffective. Take a look at Matthew chapter 28 verses 19 to 20 and observe particularly Jesus' command. So do you understand the communication between teacher and disciples by Jesus' use of the words, Obey everything that I have commanded you. And observe that he expects the result of this is change. So how could someone obey the commands of Jesus without first understanding them and then building his or her life on them. Obedience implies fully accepting and doing what is learned. Knowledge must be translated into action if it is to be effective. The major goal of learning then is for the learner to put truth into action. Being convinced of truth to the point of making it his or her own, and changing his or her life accordingly. So our efforts to mature Christian growth are particularly affected by this concept. Our goal is to see people changed by helping them grow in Christ so that his life can find living expression through their lives. Christian nurture helps people to be changed progressively into the likeness of Jesus. You see, when we become Christians, our lives may be far from Christ-like. However, as his life grows within us and we adjust ourselves to what we learn about him, we take on his likeness. 
You see, change must occur in learners if learning is to take place. But how are learners expected to change? For example, as a child grows, he changes. He must often continue to look much the same. Yet, gradually, they take on more adult-like characteristics. Changes are expected with growth. Learning change is generally thought of as growth, maturation, or adjustment. Many educators have identified these areas in which learning changes occur. These areas are 1. Knowledge 2. Attitudes and 3. Behavior It helps us to, to remember these by thinking of them as the head, knowledge, as the heart, attitudes, and by thinking or their hands as behavior. Again, we can make note of these three areas and may help us to remember them by thinking of the head as knowledge, the heart as attitudes, and the hands as our behavior. We want you to understand, students, that all learning change occurs in these three areas. It must affect our knowledge, our attitudes, as well as our behavior. Now, change in knowledge may include adding new information, correcting a point of view, or acquiring new or increased support for a viewpoint. Changes in attitudes involve values and feelings. Change values or feelings may reflect in increased or decreased degree of feeling about something. Changes in behavior often involve the skills that are required to do something. These changes may include developing a new skill or becoming better, faster, or more efficient in the performance of a task. Quite frequently in the spiritual realm, changes also include a changing of goals and the changing of habits, discontinuing those that are detrimental to Christian growth and acquiring those that encourage growth. So let's understand that the area of attitudes is the most difficult to change. People tend to cling to their values. Human emotions run deep, and a change in values necessitates adjustment in emotions and attitudes. Changing values is not easy. Nevertheless, this area is a primary concern of those involved in nurturing Christian growth. With proper teaching, however, changes can be brought about in all three areas in your thinking, in your feeling, and in your doing. So you see the illustration in your study guide, which depicts learning causes change in knowledge, which are facts and information, our attitudes, which is our values and feelings, and in our behavior, our skills, conduct, and action. So we've talked about the changing, the learner. Now let's talk about the levels of learning. Our third objective asks us to select the level of learning associated with the activities that we will describe. Now, when you say you know something, do you know someone after having met him just once? You may know him well enough to recognize him when you see him again, and you may remember his name. But do you really know him? Many encounters are required to know someone well. We might say that 
a growing acquaintance with someone is marked by degrees or knowledge of friendship or levels of friendship. Similarly, there are various levels of learning. We learn some information at one level and other information at another level. Many educators have identified four levels by different terms and each one is often found when nurturing is taking place. Let's take a look at these four levels of learning. One is called rote memory, R-O-T-E. In this level, the learner memorizes facts of information and is able to recall or recognize the information later. An example, the learner memorizes and recites a Bible verse verbatim. Now here's something that is not an example of it. The learner explains a Bible verse using his own words. So they're not expected to do that at the first level of learning, which is rote memory. The second level of learning is called reinstatement. The learner knows material well enough to recite it in his own words. He can change information into different forms without changing the meaning. So here's an example. The learner writes a paragraph or a paraphrase, that is, of a scripture passage or states a doctrinal point in his own words without changing the meaning. That is an example of reinstatement. Let's also take a look at something that is not an example of reinstatement. The learner writes a statement of doctrine exactly as it appears in the statement of fundamental doctrines. That is not an example of what reinstatement is. That is more related to the first level, which is rote memory. So the second stage level is reinstatement. The third level of learning is called comprehension. The learner discovers relationships among facts, integrates new information into what he has already learned, makes generalizations, forms values, and develops skills. This is comprehension, the third level of learning. Let's look at an example of this. The learner understands the meaning of a scriptural principle and applies it to his own life. Now here is something that is not an example of the comprehension level of learning. The learner repeats what the teacher said without understanding the terms or their meanings. So that is not an example of comprehension. Comprehension is when you're able to understand the meaning and to be able to apply it to your own life. So we don't want to continue to learn at that basic level, which is the rote memory level. We should be growing in our learning. And so first level that we talked about is rote memory. The second level is reinstatement. The third level that we talked about is comprehension. Now the fourth level of learning is application. The learner uses information to solve life's problems, to modify his or her behavior and attitudes, and to make evaluations of good or bad, right or wrong. And as they apply information in new and concrete situations, they engage in original creative thinking. This ability requires that the, lear that the learner identifies issues and selection and the use of appropriate data or information and the skills to resolve issues and, and solve problems. So let's talk about an example of the application level. The learner changes his habits or practices to conform to a scriptural command or principle. 
That is the application level of learning. Here's something that is not an example. The learner hears the Bible teaching about tithing explained, but fails to give any of his money in the offering. Or the teacher, the student learns that they should give cheerfully, not out of necessity, but they're always feeling obligated to give. So a person who's applying it realizes that if you're not cheerful, then God doesn't expect it. He doesn't receive it in the right way. Also, if he teaches, if you believe that God teaches that you should tithe or give, then you should be able to apply it to your life at your level of understanding. And then you apply it to your actual practices and behavior. So let's talk now about our next level. Thus far, students, we've talked about the different ways that people learn. We talked about two concepts of learning. We talked a little bit about changing the learner. And just recently, we talked about the levels of learning, which are rote memory, reinstatement, comprehension, and application. Now let's talk about our fourth outline for this week's lesson, which is how people learn. Application number four want us to relate the ways people learn with various teaching learning activities. Students must understand that it is an accepted fact that people learn. What factors are involved in human learning? How do people learn? These are some of the questions we want to answer in this section. Well, one of the ways that people learn is through the senses. The five senses. Seeing, hearing, smelling, touching, and tasting are doorways through which people physically experience their environment. People learn more through some senses than through others. From an educational research indicates that people learn through the senses in approximately the following proportion. So how we learn? Most educational research indicates that people learn 83% of what we learn is through seeing. The research suggests that 11% of what we learn is through hearing. 1.3% is learned through touching. And 1% is learned through tasting. So as we look at the educational research, seeing and hearing are considered the two most effective senses for learning. Learning is generally increased when information is both seen and heard. And retention is considerably greater when information is perceived by more than one of the senses. Now let's talk about what we retain from our learning. The research suggests that 10% of what we retain is from what we read. 20% is from what we hear. 30% is from what we see. 50% of what we retain is from what we see and hear. 70% is of what we hear and tell. And 90% of what we retain is of what we hear and do. So looking at this research, we can see that to facilitate learning and increase retention, learning activities should involve more than one of the senses. Ideally, the learning experience is maximized when the learner responds either verbally to what he has heard or actively by doing something in response 
to what he has heard. Now, let's take a look at this illustration in our study guide. On page 108, you'll see a computer screen. And you'll see a book in the man's hand, as well as earphones on his ears. So if we compare mentally what we have learned earlier in this lesson about the need for the learner to obey the truth and what you have discovered here about the senses, learning through hearing and doing is the best way to retain information. Using truth as the basis for making life choices and for guiding actions is the goal of learning. If a person is not able to make right life choices, if what they have information you've given them doesn't help them in guiding their actions, then they have not learned. So let's keep this in mind as we look at the ways people learn and how we retain what we learned. Thus far, we looked at people learn through their senses. Another way people learn is through involvement. The learner alone can do learning. He must discover truth for himself through personal interaction with the information. No one else can learn for him or force him to learn. The learner must personally interact with the material for desired changes to occur. This involvement may be intellectual, emotional, or physical. And in Christian nurture, we may add spiritual involvement. We know that people learn through a direct, active involvement and interaction with the material. And while we cannot learn for another or force them to learn, we can plan learning activities which provide opportunities that facilitate learner interaction with the truth. If you are helping someone grow spiritually, you can create a setting for the lesson, provide resources, and structure experiences which will lead them to discover, change, and learn. Another way that people learn is through practice. People learn by practice or conditioning. When an action is repeated many times, it usually becomes a habit. After that, quite routinely, without planning or even thinking about the activity, we continue to perform in the same way we have practiced. Talking is learned in this way. We learn to ride a bicycle by practice, and we learn to swim by swimming. We develop patterns of behavior in the Christian life too this way, such as reading the Bible, praying, gathering with others for worship and praise, and obeying God's word. By doing these things, we learn about our Christian life by practicing these things. Conditioning is another word that we see when we think about what we get through practice. Conditioning is considered a low level of learning because it does not require understanding by the learner. We develop habits simply by repeating the action frequently. It is quite possible to act habitually without understanding the significance of the action or realizing what is taking place. This is conditioning. Both positive and negative factors are involved in the formation of habits. And as you teach others and help them mature toward Christ's likeness, you must be aware of these factors and use this principle wisely. Another way we see people learn is through problem solving. Problem solving is a means by which people learn. 
Students, we need to understand that when faith with, faced with a difficult situation, people tend to find a solution. A common saying points to this truth. Necessity is the mother of invention. In teaching situations, it may be helpful to begin with problems the teacher and students can solve together. As the learners are led into the Bible and other resources, meaningful solutions can be found. The teacher then guides the learners through problem-solving situations. And as he does, not provide answers to every problem. As a learner considers possible alternatives and decides on a course of action, learning takes place. Not by us fixing the problem, but by guiding them to the solution of the problems themselves. This is one of the ways people learn by problem solving. So in this way, a student's critical thinking skills begin to develop and the learner begins to solve problems on their own initiative. So we see that human learning is not simple. Many factors, such as the nature of the individual, natural ability, interests and needs, Background and values are involved in the learner discovering truth for themselves and applying it to their own life experiences. Learning is equipping someone for life. Planning activities which lead the learner to interact with truth and structuring learning activities which enable them to recognize when and how to apply the lesson material for making choices and solving life's problems are a major function of the teacher. This is what we want to help people to do. You remember one of our simple definitions for to teach is to help others to learn, to help others to figure out how to make decisions and life choices. Our final section we're going to look at for how people learn is that people learn to nurture Christian growing. Learning to nurture Christian growing. Our fifth objective want us to state which learning activities are useful for Christian nurture. As we've seen in our lesson, students, Learning involves discovering and doing, interacting personally with truth, and putting that truth into practice in life. To learn means we must change. The learner must change. They must grow through modifying knowledge, adjusting attitudes, and correcting behaviors. These fundamentals of learning are essential to Christian nurture. Christian nurture is life-centered. It involves more than acquiring biblical and spiritual knowledge. Christian nurture is a process for changing lives into the likeness of Christ, enabling people to grow toward spiritual maturity. There is a body of revealed spiritual truth to be studied. God has revealed himself in the form of written truth in the Bible. Christians involved in the nurturing process will encourage people to study the scriptures and to know this information. Those involved with Christian nurture and discipleship also recognize that attitudes and values are of prime importance. Additional changes are basic to the task of Christian nurture. Jesus taught the very purpose of the Christian is to love God with his total being. This love, which is an expression of the will, is extended to his neighbor 
and ultimately it is revealed in his own self-concept. Love permeates the attitudes and values of a Christian. And how these attitudes are projected depends on how one has learned to express them. Growing spiritually and becoming more Christ-like helps us make attitude adjustments to be more like him. And likewise, students, knowing and feeling are not enough. Full obedience to Christ is necessary. We are not fulfilling our responsibility to nurture Christian growth until the truth finds living expression in believers. Obedient conduct is basic to the Christian life. And since our task in Christian nurture and discipleship is to foster spiritual life, we must seek to help people grow until the life of Christ finds mature living expression in their behavior. So we've taken a look at lesson four of our course, Foundations for Discipleship, help, Helping Christians to Grow. We've looked at lesson number four this week, which is discovering and doing. We talked about the two concepts of learning. We talked about changing the learner, the levels of learning, how people learn, and learning to nurture Christian growth. I pray that you will be blessed and edified as you review and apply these learning principles to your own personal life and your ministry life. We certainly look forward to our next session of discovery with you. And in the meantime, may God bless you and prosper you by his Holy Spirit as you discover and apply these principles to your life. God bless you.